The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Policy and Government Oversight Committee will now begin. Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Jenkins. I am the chair of the Policy and Government Oversight Committee, and I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Thursday, September 9th. I will note for the record, this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under the Minnesota Open Meeting Law Section 13D.021 due to the declared state of local public health emergency. I'll also note that the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to Minnesota Open Meeting Laws. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Reich. Here. Gordon. Here. Fletcher. Here. Cunningham. Osman. Here. Goodman. Present. Cano. Bender. Schrader. Here. Here. Sorry. Councilmember Bender is recorded as present. Schrader. Here. Johnson. Palmasano. Present. Ellison. Chair Jenkins. Present. There are nine members present. Uh, let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. And also for the record, I did hear from council members Johnson and Cano. Um, the latter is ill and the former is traveling uh, on behalf of city uh, of city business. Um, so um, uh, colleagues, we have 22 items on our agenda today, including two discussion items, and we will hear um, reports from standing committees as well as uh, there is no committee of the whole um, schedule this cycle uh, due to the uh, Monday holiday that uh, preceded this. So we'll begin with the consent agenda. And item number one is a memorandum of understanding with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Item two is a grant acceptance from AmeriCorps. Item number three authorizes issuance of an RFP for the Convention Center and Target Center Consulting Pool. Item number four authorizes an agreement with Sundial Solar for purchase of two, uh, I'm sorry, for purchase of renewable electricity. Item number five is a contract with Deloitte Consulting LLP for diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting services. Item number six is a contract with um, Johnson Controls for security monitoring services. Item number seven is a contract amendment with Smart Data Solutions for scanning, uh, record labeling, and data transfer services. Item number eight is a contract amendment with Hillcrest Development for Public Works Parking at 900 uh, 6th Avenue Southeast. Item number nine is a contract amendment with Meyer, Scherer, and Rock Castle L Limited for um, architect and engineer of uh, record services for the public service building project. Item number 10 is a contract with Grease Linhart Allen, PLLP for workers' compensation and legal services. Items number 11 through 19 are legal settlements. Item number 20 is a resolution approving the appointment of election judges and deputy city clerks in connection with the November 2nd, um, 2021 municipal elections. Um, 
And I will note for the record that uh, Councilmember Cano and myself are working with staff uh, on the staff directive and update relative to the um, Hiawatha Maintenance Facility Campus Expansion that was introduced at our last regular meeting. While this item was intended to return to this body for today's meeting, we're still uh, working to um, finalize this work and aiming to return this to the next regular uh, meeting scheduled for September 22nd. And with that, I will ask if any of my colleagues wish to comment on any of these items or pull anything from discussion, Council Member Gordon. Well, thank you very much. I did want to comment on 11 through 19 and maybe have a little discussion. I'm not sure. So those are the legal settlement settlements. We've been into a routine now where the council president usually makes some comment about these as they come in. And also we usually get some emails prior to this appearing on the agenda where people are concerned. And I'll just note that this is um, eight legal set settlements. Um, I didn't total up the tally, um, but when you look into the um, RCA and you look at it, all you see is it's a city employee um, and the, the, um, it's a very brief report and that the attorney's office is recommending this settlement that has been negotiated. I think at some point, maybe soon, it would be really helpful if we could get some kind of information about these legal set settlements. Are they from one or two departments in particular? Um, is this unusual? Are they are we paying out more in workman's comp this year than ever before? Um, is there any kind of connections or relations to them? I don't really have a staff direction plan now. I wanted to express this um, opinion to all of you. Um, that maybe we could come up with something as a committee now, or maybe this is something that um, we could bring forward at, at the council, or maybe this is something that the, the chair can talk to the city attorney's office about and figure out what kind of report could they actually give us. And maybe I'll take some, some time between now and the council meeting to reach out and see. I'm sure we're gonna get some resistance about how we, this is attorney client privileged information. We really don't want, um, to be too public about any of these. So I'm interested in getting an aggregate report just generally so we can better understand how are we shaping up this year compared to other years and how are we shaping up in terms of where are we seeing most of our workman comp settlements coming from in terms of um, class of employee department they're working in those kinds of things. Thanks for letting me um, share that with you all now. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. Uh, is there a city attorney on the call that can respond to this um, inquiry? Council Vice President Jenkins, um, Councilmember Gordon, Eric Nelson, Deputy City Attorney. Um, it's something I can look at to see within the bounds of the law what we can provide. Uh, I don't have an answer for you right now. Well, that would be great. I didn't expect an answer right now necessarily, and I want, yep. but I wanted to publicly make the request here at the committee for, for you all. Yep. And I, I made a note as well, Councilmember Gordon, to follow up with the city attorney's office to see if in fact we can um, uh, produce some kind of report. I, I do know that these are personnel issues, so um, clearly work Ms. Cobb. All right. Um, Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions or concerns from folks? Council member um, Bender, I see you turned on your camera. Did you have a comment or a question? Oh, yes, thanks, Madam Chair. I put myself in queue. I did. Uh, I appreciate Council member Gordon commenting on this. I do make it a practice to make sure that we acknowledge the settlements, which I believe in this case today total a little over $3.3 .3 million just in the spirit of transparency and so folks don't feel like we are trying to sweep this under the rug or not acknowledge this financial challenge that our city is having. I do know that projections related to increased work workers' compensation is reflected in the mayor's proposed budget. So I hope and expect that um, talking about this financial risk to our city will be part of this year's budget discussions as well as the conversations we'll have about the five-year financial projection. 
I think that as Councilmember Gordon noted, talking about this as a, you know, in aggregate as a policy issue um, is important. I know that, you know, that the law protects workers privacy and, and that we're limited in what we can say about any, any individual case. Um, so that may be another mechanism for us to approach this policy issue. Of course, there's also some, I'm sure, legal strategy related to how much um, information to share as there are cases working their way through the legal process. So appreciate the answer from Mr. Nielsen and, and the thought that our city attorneys can put into helping us address this from a, a policy perspective and a budget perspective. Thanks. Thank you, Madam President. I did put myself in queue as well, just to uh, comment on item number four, which is the Sundial Solar. Um, I know that we all had received um, uh, correspondence um, inquiry about some of the um, finer details of, of the contract, and we did uh, get a subsequent update from um, Mr. Havey. I, I just want to um, note, you know, that this is a really significant um, opportunity for the city to um, um, address our climate crisis emergency that we declare. Um, it is also an opportunity for us to, to support and create um, uh, a green workforce consisting of communities of color. And, and I hope that we can um, really um, lean into that in the next round of um, funding by you know, supporting organizations that are participating in, in, in helping with those kinds of um, training opportunities and, and not necessarily just rely on um, what I would characterize as a trickle down kind of approach. Um, and so I just wanted to make that comment and um, I see that there are no other um, comments or concerns. So I will, um, uh, move approval of the consent agenda. Is there any uh, further discussion? The clerk will now call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham is absent. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Kano is absent. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson is absent. Palmasano. Aye. Ellison is absent. Chair Jenkins. Aye. There are nine eyes. So um, that carries and those items are approved. Item number 21 is uh, the green zones work plans uh, presentations and, and progress update. And we'll hear from Kelly Molman. And I do uh, know that I think there are some community members uh, here as well. So uh, Ms. Molman, welcome. Thank you, Chair Jenkins and council members. My name is Kelly Molman. I use she, her pronouns. I'm with the Sustainability Division of the City Coordinator's Office. Uh, we'll also have guests uh, from the Green Zones Advisory Committees here to present as well today, including Kosar Mohammed, Roxanne O'Brien, and Leslie Jackson. So we are here today to give you an update on the Green Zones Initiative. It's been a couple of years, so it's very exciting to be in front of you now. And I wanted to start the presentation by grounding us in previous council decisions that have led us to this work. So the next slide, please. And next slide again. The Climate Action Plan was adopted by City Council in 2013, and one of the items within the Climate Action Plan is to develop a green zone initiative. And it is described as a city designation, an environmental and economic development tool for neighborhoods or clusters of neighborhoods 
that face the cumulative impacts of environmental, social, political, and economic vulnerability. Next slide, please. It is also referenced in the Minneapolis 2040 Comprehensive Plan, which City Council adopted in 2018. There is a policy specifically on environmental justice and green zones. This is a portion of the definition of environmental justice, which speaks to the right to a clean, safe, and healthy quality of life for people of all races, incomes, and cultures, and emphasizes accountability, democratic practices, remedying the historical impact of environmental racism, just and equitable treatment, and self-determination. Next slide. Within that policy area of environmental justice and green zones, there are some action steps that specifically refer to the green zones. They speak to supporting the south side and north side green zone, to reducing environmental and social inequities in the green zones, to ensure that investments are done carefully so they're uh, to avoid gentrification and displacement, and to explore opportunities to implement strategies related to the green zones in all enterprise business lines to address the inequities related to environmental injustice. Next slide. We also follow the core principles of community engagement, which City Council adopted in 2007. And again, this speaks to the involvement of impacted community members um, and having the, the agency um, to make decisions um, on things that are going to impact their lives. Next slide. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the specific work on the green zones in the last few years. Again, just kind of as a reminder um, for setting the context for this presentation. Next slide. In 2014, several community members in the Phillips neighborhoods came together to conduct a health impact assessment uh, for the Phillips community on a future green zones in Minneapolis. These are the goal areas or topic areas that they were looking at. Building off of that work, go to the next slide. The city established a citywide green zone work group in 2016. Sorry, that should take, say 2016 um, and came up with these goal areas to advance air quality, affordable and available green housing, greening, which includes vegetation and clean energy, soil and water contamination cleanup, healthy food access, and green jobs. And at the core of any strategies would be to promote equity and prevent gentrification and displacement. Next slide. Based on these goals, the City Council adopted two geographic areas for the North Side and South Side Green Zone. This was based on a significant amount of data that we pulled into GIS and determined that these two geographic areas were the most impacted based on air quality, contaminated sites, housing characteristics, food access, vegetation, health outcomes, race or language spoken, age, disability status, and employment. We're actually in the process of doing a five-year update to this data. Our Northside Promise Zone Vista, Julia Evelyn, is running several maps a couple, uh, some initial findings for a couple of the data sources we were looking at. Uh, one is related to rental housing. Um, so comparing the data from 2016 that we used to build um, this data set to 2021, the quality of rental housing, which we used as an indicator of tier two and tier three rental housing in each census tract across the city, um, has improved significantly citywide, uh, but we are still seeing a disparity with the most tier two and tier three rental housing properties in the north side and south side green zones. And then related to asthma hospitalizations, we compared the initial data that we used in this mapping here from 2009 to 2013 data to more recent 2014 to 2018 data. We're seeing a similar pattern um, where citywide there is a there has been a decrease in asthma hospitalizations or the rate of asthma hospitalizations, but we're still seeing that the highest rate of asthma hospitalizations uh, is in the north side and south side green zones. Next slide. So now I'm going to get into the fun, juicy new information that we're really excited to be here to present to you. And this is the work that we have been doing uh, since 2018. Uh, developing work plans, um, conducting community projects, and more. 
Um, so I want to hand it off now to Kosar Mohammed, who's going to speak about the process of developing the Southside Green Zone work plan. Go to next slide, please. Go ahead, Kosar. Thank you for that, Kelly. I was stuck on mute. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Chair Jenkins and Council Members. My name is Kosar Mohammed. My pronouns. Thank you. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a voting member of the Southside Green Zones um, Council. So, with our Green Zones work plan, we were able to successfully work with um, consultants that were hired by the city and that were subject matter experts both in grass top as well as grass root work. We were able to work with them on the Southside Green Zones Council's work plan that was formally tasked with um, really developing what were grass root options to really addressing the various um, socioeconomic issues that folks were dealing with. We were able to work together it simultaneously on what the opportunities uh, on hand were, as well as what were the challenges we were all facing. Um, some of the highlighted points of this were the fact that community members coming from diverse backgrounds, but oftentimes were working in silos, had the opportunity to come and work together, um, be able to enjoy food, be able to enjoy time, and also have childcare during that time as well. So it really, really was holistic in design and framework, um, and really provided all of us an opportunity to provide our expertise based of our, off of our lived experiences as well. Um, next slide. So for the Southside Green Zones work plan, we we're really looking at what does it look like for self-determination and accountability, and then looking further into how does that trickle into land use, air and soil, healthy foods and access, health and energy and housing, green economies and anti-displacement. There's various different elements that layer on top of each other for these, but we found out that holistically when working with these subject matter experts, hearing community feedback, that ultimately if all of these pieces are invested in deeply and community expertise are really utilized and honed into, we're able to find solutions that were going to significantly impact how folks' lived experiences could really be improved in the Southside Green Zone areas as well as the Northside Green Zones as well. Next slide. And for the Northside Green Zones work plan, similarly, folks were able to, I think Kelly can further develop into that piece and talk about their experience and how they were able to go across that process. Thank you, Kosar. So the Northside Green Zone work plan had a similar process of working with a couple consultants, um, worked with James Trice and Sam Grant um, to go through a process of identifying based on those broad citywide goals, what does the specific implementation or action items look like within the context of North Minneapolis and, and Northeast? Um, so these are the overall section areas of the work plan. Um, which are very similar to the Southside work plan. So at, at this point, I wanted to go through and give some examples of what those action items look like. We don't have enough time in this presentation to go through both of the work plans in their entirety because there's 70 recommendations within the Northside Green Zone work plan and 80 within the Southside Green Zone work plan. So we'd be here all day. Uh, next slide, please. Both, both of the work plans have sections on land and air pollution and soil quality. So a couple examples of the action items include um, in the Southside Green Zone work plan to adopt a municipal version of the Phillips cumulative levels and effects legislation um, to really dig into what are the overall impacts to community, how does any new uh, project or process or policy impact uh, the overall pollution that exists. Uh, and the Northside Green Zone work plan, a similar policy to, uh, recommendation to, uh, to create a city, city policy for environmental review on public and private development in the Northside Green Zone. Next slide. And one thing I'll say in terms of the focus on land, I think both previous in the previous slide and with this current slide um, is it's as critical part of the environmental injustice experienced by communities of color. What they experience today 
is based on land use planning and policies of the past. Um, building the national highway system through black and brown communities, redlining and racial covenants, forcing black and brown residents to live in limited geographic areas, which were frequently adjacent to freeways or industry, and how closely we allowed housing and industry to be near each other. Race and justice neutral decision making now only perpetuates the status quo. So what the green zones are offering in many of these recommendations are intentional data and community informed policy and land use recommendations to address those past harms and move towards a just future. Within the healthy food section, um, really want to uphold that the food action plan is in process and the green zones both fully support um, the development of that and the homegrown Minneapolis program. Um, recommendations examples here include dedicating resources and land and staffing um, for the city and for the community around gardening um, in the north side work plan to align goals and partner with the homegrown food policy council. Next slide. In the areas on housing and energy, um, these were kind of combined in the Southside Green Zone work plan. Um, there is a recommendation to tie city funding for private developers to strong standards for environmental health, energy, and affordability. Uh, and I know that um, sustainability and other departments, including CPAT, are working on a sustainable building policy um, and a variety of ways to impact how city puts funding out for private development um, of housing um, and have or seeing some very successful partnerships and a lot of really great activity there. Uh, the Northside Green Zone Work Plan has action items relating to supporting alternative models for promoting the affordability and ownership of housing and supporting zero carbon homes or other sustainable housing development, uh, similar to what I was saying before. And I think we've seen a lot of actions come forward from City Council in the last couple of years, even since these work plans were under development to support alternative models for promoting affordability and ownership of housing across the city. Next slide. Within the Southside Green Zone Work Plan, there's a section on green economy and anti-displacement. One of the recommendation or action items in there is to add green zone requirements to the sale of private of public land to private developers. Um, again, providing the, the agency for community members to have a say in what happens within their communities. And then in the section on the green workforce in the North Side Green Zone Work Plan um, is to create career pathways to renewable energy, energy efficiency, and construction. Uh, it seems timely to be mentioning this as we, uh, as Council, you all just approved um, the, the solar purchase for the city. Next slide. Within the Southside Green Zone Work Plan, there is a section on self-determination and accountability. COSAR spoke to this um, quite eloquently. Um, and so a couple of recommendation or action items from that section is to provide sustained budgeting for Southside Green Zone Work Plan focus areas and to foster community input into um, city proposals or requests for proposals that happen within the Southside Green Zone. The Northside Green Zone has a section on environmental education and community empowerment. Um, this section, the recommendations in this section speak to really resourcing um, community based actions such as, um, you know, documentaries and other educational promotional items, developing podcasts and hosting uh, community climate events. Next slide. And the final unique section that the Northside Green Zone Work Plan has um, is around community healing and violence prevention. The Northside Green Zone Task Force was very intentional about the fact that community healing and violence prevention is a core component of environmental justice. Um, so here are a couple examples of action items within that section of the work plan. Um, first, to acknowledge the PTSD of community related to racial trauma. And another is around emergency preparedness to help Northside Green Zone residents cope with future problems related to climate change. Next slide, please. So that was just a taste of the work plan. I hope that intrigues you all enough to go back and dig in deeper to those documents. They are on the city's website um, and I believe attached to the RCA. Now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the activities that 
community members on the green zones have supported even while developing those work plans um, and since. So in 2019, uh, there was some city funding, some one-time general fund dollars that were available, um, and we were able to put out pop-up funds for the Southside Green Zone to fund community projects to advance these environmental justice goals. Um, and so it ended up funding 13 projects that across a variety of different organizations and individual leaders um, that include uh, the variety of items that are listed here. So one, in one instance, there was installation of an air pollution monitor. There were several projects that related to food access, whether it was gardening, improving refrigeration at a food shelf, uh, mobile produce, uh, things like that. Um, there was holistic healing pop-ups, culturally based environmental programming, community cleanups, and just general community engagement and education. It was, we found that was one of the best ways for the community to even hear about the Green Zone's work and the city's work on environmental justice. In the Northside Green Zone, they similarly had um, a small amount of general fund dollars in 2019 uh, to advance Green Zone's projects. And Green Zone's members worked on uh, an event called the Northside Climate Reality Event. Um, the Green Zone members helped sponsor the, the event. Um, there was also uh, an event in collaboration with Coco and Lala uh, called the Taste of Northside, which was a BIPOC food, food business promotion event hosted at NEON. Uh, the Green Zones has also supported um, some initial community healing circles that Northside Green Zone member Yolanda Adams-Lee has supported, um, and that has continued on since some very small initial one-time funding. And then I also, I wanna open the floor now to Roxanne O'Brien, who's gonna speak to um, her work on the um, emergency and healing kits. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, I'm Roxanne, and I'm just here to talk about the kits. Um, Welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, so, I mean, these kits were like a part, um, like a partnership between Juxtaposition Arts and some of the kits that they had been making, but like in combination with Green Zones, we had came up our committee um, around tr trauma response and emergency preparedness had came up with the idea to have like a Green Zone edition of this box of this healing kit. And so we had the young people come up with some ideas and just kind of put together a box that can be reused. Everything in the box was like reusable. So I think there was like a piece of like cultural cloth that, you know, people can make with shrines. Um, there's a mason candle jar that you can always reuse the jar. I think the, the utensils were um, bamboo, so they were reusable. We had some sage in there. Um, and one of the biggest things, ideas that we, the Green Zones had came up with is that they wanted to put these solar chargers in the box. So the solar charger, you know, a lot of these gifts got given away to people who were experiencing trauma, whether that was gun violence or um, we also just passed out a few. We gave some to Green Zone members to take to each neighborhood organization. Um, but in the end, it was really nice as I had some feedback from someone who has a child who has seizures. And apparently there was an, as an incident um, in near north where someone had hit a gas line. So Excel had to cut off um, the electricity for a while. And then there was no way to charge her phones or anything. And so like this solar charger was charged in the sun. She had already charged it a while back. And then when that came, when that happened, she was like, thank God I had a way to like charge my phones and keep my child happy for the night during that dark time. And I was um, just thankful that, you know, it came to use to somebody. At least we got some feedback. Um, and a lot of people just love the gift in general. So that was cool. And then it even kind of, um, it, it, it helped us to, in the future, make new bags. Um, also, but it, the Green Zones was really supportive to a lot of work through C a lot of work that CMEJ um, led on. And so we decided to make some kits, some bags, some newer bags. So some of the young people that came up with like this, I don't know if you can see it, but came up with these ready to eat meals. So you could just pour water in them and then they like self heat up 
a lot of times during environmental disasters, the electricity is like the first thing to go. And um, I know when the tornado came, there was like gas leaking and all sorts of things. So in the event of that and somebody's hungry, they can self heat that if they have some water bottles, which we encouraged a lot of people to start um, stocking up on water bottles for various reasons. And in this bag, we also did the solar charger again. So we thought it was one of the most um, exciting things about the last box. So we put that in this one. Um, the young people really decided the list. So they put in um, CPR bags, um, a water straw for, I guess, the, you know, the lake or the water to filter it out and drink. And then um, just a little, a foil rescue blanket. So, you know, we're just kind of getting creative with ideas on what people could possibly need in an event of an environmental disaster or, and you know, environmental disasters can cause other chaos and people to like freak out, go through mental health, um, go through mental health problems and also just, you know, violence, things can happen and when people are stressed out. So we are looking forward to continuing the work and it's really important that Green Zones also gets funding that it needs um, in the future because the staff were really supportive to making sure that even grassroots organizations like CMEJ had the support we needed to get for other funding, even though the city hadn't put that much funding towards Green Zone. So we'd appreciate more support in the future, but yeah, there was a lot done. So this was just one thing. Thank y'all. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. And I, I just want to just comment briefly about the emergency kits. Um, they are so impactful and so, um, I think, important, an important response to, um, uh, as you noted, um, environmental disasters. But, you know, I mean, the pandemic has created uh, disaster type conditions as well as the uprisings that we experience. And so these these emergency kits, these trauma response healing kits can be used in a variety of scenarios. And, and I think it's brilliant that they, um, you know, they address environmental uh, concerns, but also um, the, the humanity uh, as well with you know, the, the kit we're looking at has the the authentic fabric and the sage and, and the reusable candles and jars. So um, just want to just say thanks for that creativity um, that is emanating from the north side green zones as well as the south side green zones. And, and hopefully those groups and maybe we'll hear about this a little bit more, but I think there's been some cross pollinization of both groups and um, potentially you can talk about that as well, Ms. Moman. Yes, thank you so much, Chair Jenkins. Um, next slide. To really kind of elevate and emphasize what Roxanne was saying and, and also uh, to Chair Jenkins' point, there, this work has really been the the labor and passion of the members of the Green Zones Advisory Committees. Um, I know they're within the structure of the city's appointed board and commission, but they really operate almost like many nonprofits in a way. They're running programs, they're developing policy recommendations, um, they're advocating for education for their community and for policymakers, and they're raising funding to make sure these projects can go forward. Um, so I wanted to highlight that even in 2020, during the height of COVID, the murder of George Floyd and the unrest and uprisings that happened both within the South Side and North Side Green Zones, both the Green, North Side and South Side Green Zone working groups or advisory committees were very active, very productive um, for their communities. Uh, Roxanne O'Brien in particular and community members for environmental justice were um, take, took the lead on advocating for a presentation to city council on the connection between air pollution and COVID-19. Um, there was several uh, funding uh, applications that were awarded 
Um, I added them up and I think there was nearly $400,000 since the beginning of Green Zones that um, has been brought in from other public agencies or private entities to support the Green Zones work. There's uh, multiple initiatives that Green Zone members have started as very small pilot projects that have grown into their own nonprofits or into larger initiatives. Um, and all of this also happened um, when we lost su sufficient funding to keep, uh, to keep the facilitators, the paid professional facilitators going. So this was all happening while Green Zone members also took over the leadership um, for uh, organizing the agendas and facilitating their meetings. Um, so additionally, we've had Green Zone members on the review committee for the Minneapolis Climate Action and Racial Equity Fund so that the proposals are grounded in uh, community knowledge and the awards are given uh, based on feedback from uh, community members themselves. Um, and as well, the Green Zones collectively, speaking to your point, um, Chair Jenkins, that the Green Zones collaborated on recommendations for development within the Green Zones. Next slide. One of the projects that Southside Green Zone worked on was a creative city making project. So we um, had the fortune of working with Rory Wakemup, uh, artist and um, a videographer, Lorenzo Cerna, who helped us put together a series of videos on the Southside Green Zone, which are available on our website. These are just some screenshots of them. Next slide. And so finally, I wanted to wrap up with kind of, so what is the next step? Where is this work going? What is the vision for the Green Zones going forward? Uh, next slide. Uh, since the beginning, or I should say since the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, the North Side and South Side Green Zone have started coming together in uh, joint quarterly meetings. Um, because there is so much overlap in the areas of interest that they have, whether it's on uh, mitigating air pollution or uh, in, impacting policy making that's happening within the green zones or development within those communities. Um, there's a lot of overlapping interest. And so um, we have those quarterly joint meetings and from that has come several ideas. Um, one for a community air monitoring project uh, that is moving forward with the support of the city's health department staff and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, so we're just having some initial planning sessions. Uh, we're really excited. This is going to put air monitors into the hands of community members so that they can collect data on areas of their concern about and place them in locations uh, where they have questions. They'll collect the information and be able to educate their own community members and the city and other agency staff on what they're finding. Um, we also want to invest, we want to inquire into what would be, what's the best structure for the green zones going forward? Um, is this work truly fit under the appointed boards and commission structure, or does it look like something else, more of a partnership between the city and community? What would that look like? So it's an area that we want to investigate. Um, as Roxanne was also talking about, we also want to to secure long-term support or funding for the Green Zones work. How do we ensure that this work is really institutionalized, whether within the city or as perhaps a partnership? Um, and part of that is supporting community projects and the self-determination and accountability. Next slide. So, um, if, if I may be so bold as to put a, a request to the council today, um, really what we're asking for from the city is resources, whether that's direct funding or assistance in identifying funding uh, for this work um, to continue uh, these community-based projects to implement the Green Zone work plans and potentially to facilitate this reimagining of a Green Zone structure as well as support in the sort of integration or uh, institutionalizing of this environmental justice work across the city departments um, and sort of building that pathway for a long-term structure and support um, for this work. Um, we were hoping that Leslie Jackson was going to be joining us today. I don't see her on the call. Um, she was going to offer some comments if she is there and I'm not seeing her. All 
All right. Well, if not, um, I just want to say how grateful I am to have the time in front of you all today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with all of the amazing community members um, that have been part of the Green Zones uh, past, present, and future. Um, it really is uh, an honor, a pleasure. Um, and um, go to the next and last slide, which is just a thank you and an acknowledgement of all of the people um, who have deeply touched this work and, and made it what it is, and many who probably are not even named on this list. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Mauman, and, and to the community uh, members that um, participated in the presentation as well. Really um, a comprehensive overview of the, the past few years and the work that both of these um, um, committees have been doing on behalf of their respective geographical communities, but as well, the city of Minneapolis as a whole. Um, and, you know, I, during, at the beginning of the pandemic, myself and Commissioner Musicant chaired um, the Shared Power Advisory Committee or the SPAC as it were. Um, and, and that may be um, a potential model to look um, at in terms of um, the shared power recommendation that was brought forth. And, and I think we do need to really look into, um, you know, whether this structure or these, this work, these committees fit under the uh, boards and commissions or, or should it um, occupy another kind of structure. And so um, really grateful for the report and grateful for all the work that all of the committee members have been um, putting in, uh, many of whom I know uh, both on the north side and the south side green zones. It looks like we have council member Gordon in queue. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair Jenkins. and. This moment, I have to say that um, you deserve a lot of credit for this. Um, I remember when we were just um, figuring out and trying to start the green zones and it wasn't very easy. It wasn't easy to come up with criteria. It wasn't easy deciding on how many to have. Um, I'm really grateful for the community for getting it into our climate action plan. I don't think we would have thought of this if it didn't come to us from community members. And um, I, I think it was kind of a, um, challenging to get done and now it's very significant that we've been keeping keeping it going this far you can imagine i'm a little bit nervous when i hear about um reimagining the structure um and um think it's probably time that we do that but i think we have to do it carefully and we have to do it thoughtfully i'm very much interested in making sure that we have the resources that we need for the green zones to do um, and I'm also very interested in seeing how we can take some of the things that we've done within the green zones themselves um, to also address environmental injustice, the historic environmental injustices that have happened outside of those green zones um, to areas or pockets or individuals. So I liked that last slide and it was intriguing. It would be easier, I think, for the council and for me if there was a, a clearer proposal about what um, what would the process of reimagining um, look like and coming up with a different structure? I think it would be really, really important that we have uh, an internal team involved in that from different departments. I would say that the health department has been um, really critically important in this work, um, as has the sustainability office and the coordinators department. And we do have our division of innovation. So thinking about, okay, what kind of staff team would it take and or would it take um, a consultant to assist us in this? You know um, that we're entering into our budget discussions now. I don't believe there is anything coming from the mayor saying um, that we should invest a little bit in improving the structure or how the green zones are functioning and working. Um, 
So it may take a budget amendment to actually get some resources there. So that would be something I'd be interested in hearing more about and getting more details. And just knowing the way um, the green zones are operating, that would also include the voices of the community who's out there right now in terms of what they want. I suspect if things are going fairly well now, um, there may be concerns too. What would changing the structure actually do? Um, I'll just note that I see instances where the city council and the mayor decide, oh, we want to um, kind of um, let this be more independent and it can go off on its own over there. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't um, because then sometimes there's no longer that vested interest of city government to want to be involved and see that it's successful and to step in like we've been and staffing it and providing resources now. So, um, and I know we probably don't have a really long time to have a discussion today about all of this, but the fact you've introduced it is significant and I look forward to um, helping and seeing what we can do with this budget cycle, maybe to help set something up, maybe some future staff directions so that we can begin this process of taking it to the next level. The last thing I'll just say is when we um, ag agreed on two green zone areas, there was always a discussion about maybe we should develop some criteria. So what happens when we want to create more and maybe there's other ways to do it. And I don't know if we come up with a um, not not a, not a deep green zone, but a, a, a another green zone, because there are communities that want to take advantage of um, some of the things that we're offering and address the problems in their area too and could use some resources. Um, but I know we want to pay attention to it. It's that um, qualifying equation that we developed. It's rather complicated. Um, and I appreciate that we're reviewing that now too. So it's interesting to see that and it'll be interesting to see what we come up with next and what that data might just show about our city. So it's probably a long enough speech for now. Thanks for indulging me, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. Um, are there any other um, comments or, or questions? Seeing no further um, discussion, I will just thank you so much for uh, for that presentation once again. Um, really great work. Um, and I will echo, echo uh, Councilmember Gordon's um, acknowledgement of your work, Ms. Molman, um, and and the work of, of all of our um, community members. So thank you so much. Um, and then seeing no further discussion, I will um, direct the clerk to file that report. Item number 22 on our agenda is the residential building energy disclosure policies implementation update. Uh, that's a mouthful. I will invite uh, Luke Holenkamp from the city coordinator's office to introduce this item. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Council Vice President Jenkins. Uh, again, I'm Luke Holenkamp from- Thank you uh, and welcome. Thank you from the sustainability division within the city coordinator's office and uh, today also i'm joined by christina dowling of regulatory services and um, she'll uh, chip in if there's any questions um, that she can answer uh, from her department again i'm here today and thank you very much for having me here today uh, to discuss the time of rent ordinance and particular in particular the energy disclosure ordinances the suite of which were adopted a few years back and the implementation of those ordinances. Next slide, please. To uh, set the stage for this conversation, I wanted to uh, just bring our attention to what many of us um, heard a few weeks back, which is an urgent call for climate energy action in the IPCC's most recent report. Um, some of the words um, that were picked up by the media came directly from the Secretary General describing this as a code red for humanity, and then we need to urgently um, step up our actions to uh, make sure we don't exceed one and a half degrees Celsius of warming, and that really the viability of our societies depends on uh, leaders such as yourselves in government, uh, businesses such as the utilities, and also civil society uniting to make these changes. And the Secretary General in particular called out an immediate need for action on energy and energy policy. We're seeing the impacts of climate change here in 
Minnesota and even within the Twin Cities. Obviously, uh, we are all familiar with the Boundary Waters fires and the Canadian wildfires earlier this year and the uh, immense impact it had on the air quality of all of us Minneapolis residents. Next slide, please. So to help tackle the climate change, to do our part as a city, we, the city council and the mayor, then passed residential energy disclosure policies, a suite of them, in early 2019. These policies were called for by the city's climate action plan in 2013, and the intent was to, was to promote energy efficiency and housing affordability. There are also many additional benefits to these policies, such as energy awareness for residents within the city, providing key information during housing decision making for residents, creating an incentive within the marketplace for property owners to make energy improvements and reduce energy burden for Minneapolis residents. Next slide, please. This suite of policies really incorporated three particular elements. There was the truth and sale of housing energy disclosure reports, which were added on to the existing TISH reporting. Multifamily building benchmarking was implemented, which was added on to the existing commercial energy benchmarking ordinance, as well as then time of rent reporting, which I'll spend most of my presentation on today, was uh, created anew for providing uh, tenants with energy costs of properties that they may be looking to reside within. Next slide, please. To provide a very high level 30,000 foot view of where the implementation of these policies are, uh, the slide here shows that the TISH energy reports have been implemented. They were completed in 2020. Multifamily building benchmarking was completed in two waves in 2019 and 2020. And time of rent, for reasons I'll go into, was ended, ended up being split into three different categories by size of building. And two of those three categories went into effect uh, just a little over a week ago on September 1st. And one category of building, the smallest buildings, is not yet complete. And I'll go into more details on how we're working with the utilities to come to a solution on that. Next slide, please. The Truth and Sale of Housing Energy Disclosure Report, which was implemented in January 2020, uh, has been extremely successful. This added a new two-page energy disclosure report to the end of existing TISH reports. It then provided information on insulation levels, windows, and the heating system to buyers of properties. And since it was implemented a year and a half ago, a little over a year and a half ago, there have been over 10,000 energy reports created in the city of Minneapolis and 650 of those alone in the green zones, an area which often has the most energy inefficient housing. Next slide, please. Looking forward, now that we've fully implemented the ordinance, we're enhancing our communications and their engagement, both last year and then this year. And we've had great partners with CEE and CenterPoint in raising awareness about these new reports and then how property owners can realize energy upgrades. Uh, there's an energy report website. We've been doing realtor education. We've also been doing home mailings and inserts into the city's water bills. And there's an energy advisor service that's just a phone call away for residents to help connect them with resources and expertise on making energy efficiency improvements. This has been uh, a wonderful success and I think has pro provided a lot of valuable resources to our residents. Next slide, please. The building multifamily building benchmarking program was implemented in two waves in 2019 and in 2020 for two different sizes of buildings. This added 350 of the largest multifamily buildings in the city to that existing commercial benchmarking ordinance. And because of this ordinance, dozens of energy audits have now been completed for these very large buildings that house many, many residents and also consume a lot of energy. Many of those audits were done through a joint program for the utilities, the Multifamily Building Efficiency Program. And also the city has partnered with those utilities as well as 
Clearway Energy, the downtown district energy provider, and CEE to provide a audit program that also wraps in the energy consumed by district energy. And we've had over 25 of those completed audits, and that's been made possible by uh, funding provided to the sustainability office from the franchise fee increase a few years back. Next slide, please. I'd like to transition now to the time of rent reporting to tenants. Again, this is the third of the ordinances within that suite of policies. The implementation has begun. Um, this ordinance has called for rental properties to disclose building energy use information to prospective tenants at the time of their application. This will give renters an upfront insight into the total housing costs, and it creates an incentive for building owners to make energy efficiency improvements. We've been working diligently with Excel Energy and Central Energy since 2018 as part of the Clean Energy Partnership to reduce the barriers and streamline compliance for property owners in this policy. However, due to recent PUC rules and some of the utilities current data policies, we haven't been, we've had to create unique compliance pathways for different sizes of buildings, um, resulting in a property owner that has multiple different sizes of buildings, perhaps having to go through different compliance pathways for each of those buildings. And I'll get into some more details on that in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So the three categories of buildings we've had to create are the 50,000 square foot and greater buildings. Those are actually the benchmarked buildings um, that I talked about in the last policy. For those buildings to comply with the time of rent ordinance, all they have to do is utilize what they've already gathered and disclosed to the city and provide tenants with links to that information so that tenants can make informed decisions on housing. So very little additional um, effort uh, needs to be done for property owners in that category. And that went into effect September 1st. Also going into effect September 1st was time of rent for five and over unit buildings. These buildings will utilize new data, new utility web tools to create energy reports, and then we'll provide those energy reports to tenants at the time of rental application. And then the third category of buildings, the one to four unit buildings, we've had to delay implementation due to the PC rules and utility data policies that I mentioned previously. So the benchmark, or the implementation of the 50,000 square foot buildings has been very straightforward, and I won't go into much more detail, but on the next slide, please, I'd like to provide more detail on the buildings that are five and over units and less than 50,000 square feet. And apologies, some of the titles appear to be getting cut off on the slides here. In this category of buildings, there's over 2,100 buildings, which have 32,000 residential housing units and about 800 owners. What compliance looks like for these owners is they use these utility data tools to aggregate cost data within their entire building then they can create energy cost report that will give renters information in terms of monthly dollars per bedroom and monthly dollar per square foot so they can compare that against other buildings that they may be looking at and then they would provide those reports via a unique web url to prospective tenants during the time of application also note on the map here that many of these properties are clustered in certain areas of the city mostly close to downtown particularly south of downtown and the highlighted areas, or the outlined areas in green are the green zones that we just heard from my colleague uh, Kelly. And uh, there are some buildings within that area, but as you'll see later, there are many more smaller buildings in those green zones than for this particular building category. Next slide, please. This is an example of what has been created by the utilities uh, in, in joint efforts with the city to provide compliance and information to prospective tenants. So in the background there, there is a new web tool platform created by each of the utilities to compile data to do the work for a building owner. And each utility has their own platform, but it's actually developed by the same software developer. So that helps ease, in, uh, ease compliance for property owners in that the two tools they have to use are substantially similar. From that tool, 
they get up to the left a um, detailed energy report. And then specific in that energy report is information pertaining to the costs of, in this case, gas in that building, which can be provided to tenants. Uh, this has been a great success and I uh, want to express my appreciation to the utilities, Excel Energy and Centerpoint Energy for creating these tools, which not only benefit the implementation of the ordinance and our residents and property owners, but actually provide more meaningful tools for property owners beyond the ordinance to help understand the energy impacts of their buildings and seek resources. Next slide, please. This ordinance or this category of building, the ordinance went into effect on September 1st. So we have those utility web tools and help resources created. Uh, and, so, and then on September 1st, we sent out the initial round of communication emails to impacted property owners. And through the next few months, we'll be sending out additional rounds of communication via email and mail to property owners about the ordinance. Uh, in late September, we anticipate starting our outreach and education efforts to tenants and tenants groups so that this information is useful and understandable to them. And then enforcement of the ordinance uh, would commence on November 1st on a complaint based system through regulatory services. Next slide, please. Moving on to the one to four unit category, which we've had to delay implementation of. This is a very large building category. There's 17,000 buildings. There's 32,000 units, roughly the same number of residential units as in that five and over unit category across the city. And compared to about 800 owners, there's about 13,000 owners of these properties. You can see in the map, they are spread out much more uniformly across the city, although still clustering um, in a great density close to downtown than in the far, particular far southern reaches of the city. But there is a substantial concentration of these properties, these one to four unit rental properties in the green zones, both the north and the south side green zones. Also, these one to four unit rentals house then, even outside of the green zones, many low income and low wealth households across the city. And these properties tend to also be the least efficient, um, these energy efficient housing stock. So understanding energy costs at the time of rent for renters in these neighborhoods and in these buildings can really help protect those, their households from the unexpected increases in total housing costs, one of which is energy costs. Um, we also want to uh, make sure that, that this implementation is rolled out of this category as fast as possible and as effectively as possible because of the enormous environmental justice and other justice issues pertaining to this size of property. Um, it's very unfortunate that we've had this delay, but uh, we're going to work very diligently to work through that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the delay in the next slide, please. So due to PUC's rules and uh, the utilities interpretations of those rules, there's currently not a reasonable pathway that exists for property owners to compile those energy costs and disclose that energy information to tenants in a way that is similar, substantially similar to what five plus unit buildings and their property owners are complying with. We're continuing our work with utilities to develop a pathway and we're judging that pathway based on is it reasonable for property owners to complete? We don't want it to be overly burdensome. Is it informative and empowering prospective tenants? Is it useful in making their housing decisions? And does it actually show real building specific differences in housing so that a renter can compare housing options and make an informed decision based on what the energy costs may be expected to be? Next slide, please. So there are Roughly speaking and broadly speaking, two potential paths to implement, implementing the one to four unit building category. Um, our preferred path would be to treat the one to four unit properties substantially similar to the five and over unit properties. That would require petitioning the PUC to ex 
ban data access rules to align with our local city ordinance and that the PUC then would have to grant this request. Um, some of the considerations is that if the PUC granted this request, it would provide easy entry comparisons across a broad size of buildings for renters. It would provide a uniform compliance pathway for property owners of a broad size of buildings. However, it may take one to two years um, for the uh, PUC to reach a decision and approval is not guaranteed at this time. And this pathway currently does not have the support of Excel Energy and CenterPoint Energy. Another potentially acceptable solution uh, that we are exploring further at the staff level is co-developing a different methodology to convey this property information while still abiding by the PUC's data access rules. We still believe though that it would require the PUC to in some way approve this new methodology. Some of the considerations are this is likely a more difficult energy cost comparison for renters because they may not be comparing apples to apples across different sizes of buildings. It would also be then, of course, different compliance pathways for property owners of different size buildings. However, it may take less time, potentially less than a year for a PUC decision, although again, approval is not guaranteed. And this pathway does currently have the support of our energy utilities. Um, I want to be clear that this, these are options that we as city staff are working through this time with utility staff, and we're looking to find the optimal solution um, that has the greatest benefits for our community. And that at this time, we don't need any action uh, from city council, but we just want to provide uh, these two comparisons for your information today. And next slide, please. I'd like to show what those two options mean in effect. What would a renter potentially see and what would the difference be what they see? So on the left side is a chart showing in the blue dots electric bill cost information month by month for a property. You can see it goes up and down based on weather conditions over a two year period. What would so that would not be seen by renters and property owners that remains private data for the individual that lived in that unit and was paying those utility bills. However, what we want to express then to property owners and to prospective new tenants is in the box on the right. We want to be able to convey something along the lines of that in 2019 and 2020, the average monthly electricity cost for this building was, and in our preferred solution, we would provide the, again, the simple average, in this case, $33 per bedroom monthly. That potentially acceptable alternative solution Instead of saying $33, we provide a range, would say that, that the average falls somewhere within the $29 to $40 range. That would help get around some of the PUC rules, but again, it doesn't provide as much specificity as providing an exact dollar amount. And it may end up being a little confusing to renters because as you can see, it doesn't convey the range of expected energy bills, which is much greater, $60 down to $20, it conveys the range of that an average would fall within. So these, these are the options that we are weighing at the staff level right now and trying to determine what is going to be the most effective and useful um, and accurate for renters and prospective renters to look at when they're examining housing options. Next slide, please. And finally, I'd like to finish today by just coming back to that slide I presented at the beginning, which shows that Again, for many of the policies within the, the suite of energy disclosure ordinances, uh, we've had great success so far. We've rolled out um, TISH reporting, TISH energy reports. We've rolled out multifamily building benchmarking. We've rolled out two of three categories at the time of rent. Um, and really all of those require the, um, uh, the partnership of the utilities. And we're really thankful for their partnership in that. However, you know, the task that remains to us as staff is to find a solution for these one to four unit buildings. And um, that also requires the necessary partnership and collaboration with the utilities, uh, both within their own utility policies, as well as then going with them potentially to the Public Utilities Commission um, to petition for a path forward. Um, with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for your time today. Um, as Kelly said, we really appreciate the opportunity to
provide some updates on the work that we in the sustainability division do and that uh, the city is doing more broadly on climate. And I would be uh, more than happy to take any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Holenkamp. And uh, looks like we have a question or comment from Councilmember Gordon, followed by Councilmember Schrader. Yeah, maybe it's just more of a comment. I think that um, I really appreciate the presentation and it's great to see all the progress that we've made, but it's really discouraging to see that the one to four unit buildings haven't um, made any progress and that we're still working on a solution for that. I guess in the report, you made a pretty convincing case that we should still try for the um, first solution that you mentioned so that it's um, more consistent um, with all the, with the other things and it actually gives accurate information to those renters. You know, to hear that there's um, 32,000 residents who then don't have this uh, um, and 17,000 units, obviously the one to four units is a big part of our rental housing in the city. And when we were crafting this, we wanted them to have this opportunity to see how much energy usage was going on in those buildings. I suspect that a lot of those older, smaller buildings also have a um, wide spectrum of energy efficiency, including some of our least efficient buildings are probably some of the older, smaller rental buildings. And I think we really need to get at that information. So um, I'll uh, work harder at the Clean Energy Partnership in my role to try to get the utility companies to step up um, and help us with this. I know that we need cooperation with the PUC, um, but I know that if we go there with utility companies with us, we're much more likely to get that. And I seem to recall them making pretty soft and pretty clear commitments at that table that they were going to help us solve this problem. And so I'll commit to try to help working on that. And thanks so much for the report. Council Vice President, may I add a comment to that? Yes, please. Uh, thanks, Council Member Gordon, uh, for your comments. Um, I also want to just clarify that the alternative solution uh, Actually, if we could go back two slides, please. Thank you. Um, but both, the way I see it, both of these options have pros and cons. And um, that potentially acceptable solution um, definitely has some cons. However, I would say that it could potentially become a very good solution or a great solution. Um, I think that we should hold the preferred solution as um, the the bar which with which we want to exceed with any potentially acceptable solution. So uh, we may come up with a option that actually has many more benefits, but we still have a ways to go to get there. Um, but I see the preferred solution as the bar with which we must exceed, meet or exceed. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think to start off with, wanted to jump off on Councilmember Gordon's point. You know, uh, Councilmember Gordon, myself, and Councilmember Fletcher all sit on the Clean Energy Partnership where we work with uh, Centerpoint Energy as well as Excel um, and had remit to work on this really important um, ordinance. So I, I did want to, you know, add when this was passed back in 2019, we we had we knew what these issues were. We built in a lot of cushion uh, to make sure that these were implemented. And it's you know very disappointing to see that you know we're not that uh, the utilities have not been able to help out and to get to a really critical part, uh, one that's going to help a large majority of Minneapolis residents. Um, I do want to also just send out a huge thanks to city staff who's been working on this for years. You know, when we began this, uh, we were working with with realtors, with with the utilities to make sure this was going to be a policy that was uh, going to, you know, both help with our housing crisis as well as with our climate crisis. Um, and we've seen that this has been something, you know, we've been recognized uh, regionally as being a leader. So I, I want to thank staff for their hard work. I also kind of lift that up. I think they glossed over the point that, you know, around the region, folks are looking to our policy uh, to see what they can implement in their own cities. Um, and I think uh, while congratulating, we need to be um, honest about the environmental justice and make sure that we are able to get the, the one through four units up as soon as possible. Uh, so thank you again to staff. Thank you, Sarah. Councilmember Goodman. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Hollenkamp, we are so lucky to have you. You are one of the really incredibly bright minds in our state working on these issues. And I also want to say it's got to be hard to be part of the sustainability team and not have that issue, climate change, one of the most important issues in the world, being the top priority at the city right now. And I feel for you in this regard because we all believe it's a really big issue, but ultimately so much else has taken over the policy making at the city that this hasn't gotten the level of attention it deserves. I want to point out that probably one of the best things we can do for uh, renters in this city is get on bill financing done. And your team with Mr. Havey and others have made some progress at the PUC, maybe not a complete amount of progress, but you are working within the systems that have been set up. And I want you to keep your eye on the prize as it pertains to on-bill financing, because I think that will also be not only a, uh, information for renters and an investment for renters, but it's almost a no-brainer because of the energy costs that saved as a result of these kinds of improvements. So you are working on a number of really great things. Uh, Mr. Hollenkamp, you are, we are lucky to have you. And I just wanted to make sure you knew that there are 13 people, maybe eight here today, who really truly believe that. So thanks for all of your hard work. Great, yeah, no, agree. We have inclusive, uh, zoning and now we need inclusive financing. So let's get it done. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Seeing none, thank you again, Mr. Hollenkamp for that, um, Hollenkamp for that presentation um, and, um, and for all of your efforts. And seeing no further discussion, I will direct the clerk to uh, file that report. Next, we have the reports of committees and generally this section of our um, agenda is um, uh, chaired by council member, um, council member Ellison, but, I, but he and um, Councilmember Cunningham are both at a visual um, in support of community in response to the tragic and really traumatic um, murder of a 12 year old yesterday in North Minneapolis, London Michael Bean. Um, my, my heart and my condolences go out to his family um, his parents and grandparents and, and friends at the Sojourner Truth Academy. I know that all the students there are deeply traumatized, uh, as well as just the entire North Side and the entire city, I will add. And so wanna offer my my thoughts and, and condolences once again to the to the family and just acknowledge that that is uh in fact where council members um um, Ellison and Cunningham are this this afternoon. And so um, with that stated, we will begin with the uh, reports from standing committees, the business inspections and housing um, and zoning committee report given by uh, council member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Biz Committee is bringing forward 18 items for approval tomorrow. Item one is a withdrawal from the Breakfast Bar of Minnesota, so we'll be voting to allow them to withdraw it. Item two is an interim use permit at 2103 West Broadway. Item three is the TIF plan for 2800 Wyzetta Boulevard North. Item four are the liquor license approvals and five are the renewals. Six is the AUAR at the Upper Harbor Terminal. Item seven is the uh, actually um, the Hennepin County's Affordable Housing Incentive Program. This is a resolution we need to approve in order for them to make those contributions to those projects. Item eight is a grant application to deed and nine is uh, four grants with regard to the Cultural District Interior Improvement Pilot Program. Um, and item 10 is the Great Streets Facade Improvement Program Funding Awards. 
Item 11 is another commercial property development fund loan for split rock properties. Item 12 is a bond issuance for Stone House Square Apartments on West Broadway, or actually on Broadway Northeast. Item 13 is a bond issuance for a project at 2025 West River Road. Item 14 is a contingency, a trust fund contingency pool loan for 3301 Nicolet Apartments, also an affordable housing project. Item 15 is acquisition, acquisition of easements for some property for the Border Avenue extension. Item 16 is a nuisance property condition waiver um, as the result of a fire at that location. Item 17 is a right of way vacation. And number 18 was our inclusionary zoning annual report and update. And I'll note that there is a really interesting interactive website with data uh, talking about where we're at on inclusionary zoning. Um, and I would urge folks interested to take a look at it. It's extremely well done. With that, I'm happy to answer questions about any of the items on the biz agenda for tomorrow. Thank you, Council Member Goodman. I just I do have one question um, about um, item number one. I'm not sure if I understand what the action is. They're re they're withdrawing. Yeah, you said. I, yeah. So the folks that own this um, bar called the Breakfast Bar in the North Loop submitted an application uh, to expand their space to outside. Uh, as well as um, a, no a couple of other things with regard to their liquor license. Um, and then they decided that they would withdraw that application, probably rather than getting it voted down. And so they've withdrawn the application. And as a result, we have to formally withdraw the application. So if in the future uh, they're able to uh, meet staff criteria, they can come back and reapply. Thank you so much. And I will just, I note it. Um, 3301 Nicollet on the um, agenda as well. And that's an affordable ho housing project in Ward 8 that has been a very long time coming. Uh, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, we will move to the next committee report, which is the Public Health and Safety Committee. I mentioned Council Member Cunningham, the chair of that committee, is um, at a, a, a community vigil. Uh, so that report will be given by Council Member Fletcher, who is the Vice Chair of that committee. Thank you, Council Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is moving uh, four items forward for consideration. Uh, the first is a gift acceptance from the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce uh, for services uh, from Dr. Matt Bostrom. Uh, that prompted some lively conversation and was forwarded without recommendation. Uh, so that'll be a decision we need to make at Council. Uh, item number two is a uh, grant application to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development for corrective healthy home activities. Item number three uh, is accepting a grant uh, amendment uh, from the Department of Health uh, to support maternal child health efforts. And uh, item number four is contracts with neighborhood organizations that qualified for the neighborhood's 2020 Shared Resources and Collaborations Fund. Uh, I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, um, Councilmember Fletcher. Are there any questions? Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did just want to point out that um, I did ask Deputy Chief Amelia Huffman um, to come to this committee report out today in case people did have questions. Um, I know our council meetings don't usually allow that space uh, to ask questions about her project. Um, so she is here and available. Um, I also know she has been speaking um, with colleagues who have had questions about this project. Um, I do feel that we're ready to move forward with such um, with item number one, which was forwarded without recommendation to allow some more time um, for people to take a look at it, to look at how it might fit into other departments. Um, and I, I think we, I feel ready to move this forward. Um, without putting it in another department. Um, and if people have questions or comments, um, Deputy Chief Huffman is here if you'd like her to respond. Great, are there any other questions or, or comments for um, DC Huffman?
Seeing none, um, I, I think we will have a conversation tomorrow at the council meeting. Um, and um, potentially, um, DC Huffman could be available to answer questions at that time as well. And so with that, uh, there are no more, no further questions or comments. We will proceed to uh, the next committee report, which is the Transportation and Public Works Committee. Um, that report provided by the chair, uh, Council Member Wright. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. The committee will be forwarding 10 items for consideration. Uh, item one is the accepting the grant of the uh, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. Two is a joint powers agreement with the City of Columbia Heights uh, for a shared project at 37th Street Northeast. Um, three is an easement agreement with Park and Rec for sanitary sewer at Bryn Mawr Meadows. Four is the Hennepin County Lake Street 42nd East Pedestrian Costly Safety Improvement Project. Five is the contract with um, Myovision Technologies for traffic count processing services. Six is the contract amendment with Black at Beach Corporation for design, construction, and engineering for the 10th Avenue Bridge, Water Main River Crossing. Seven is designating the uh, non-governmental tax-exempt parcel street lighting operation. Eight, likewise, is similar non-governmental tax-exempt parcel street maintenance assessments. Nine is the Whittier International Elementary School route to uh, Safe Routes to School project uh, maintenance commitment. And 10 is a bid for the Cochran ADA pedestrian ramp improvements. I would stand for questions, Madam President, uh, Vice President, as necessary. Thank you, Council Member Wright. Are there any other questions? Are there any questions? Seeing none, our next committee report is the Executive Committee, and that report will be given by the Council President, um, Council Member Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. As far as I know, we don't have any standalone items from the executive committee on the um, agenda. We did have a presentation about from staff about the transition planning related to um, vaccination and testing requirements um, that are related to the mayor's recent executive order. And so that will be on the agenda as part of that COVID emergency regulation update. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam President and um, and colleagues and to all of our uh, presenters today. Lots of information of, about our en environmental justice and environmental issues, climate change, et cetera. Um, thank you all and seeing no further business uh, before this committee. We are adjourned. Have a great day, everyone.